This is the Pfeffer on Power podcast. I am your host, Jeffrey Pfeffer, professor at Stanford Business School. And every other week we have on this program someone to talk to us about their lessons in power so that you can be more successful and accelerate your career. And today I am pleased to welcome my good friend, an occasional class visitor, sometimes even in person, Gary Loveman. I've known Gary for a long time. Gary's career is extraordinarily interesting. He got a PhD in economics from MIT, arrived at Harvard Business School where he was a professor, including being a professor in the service management group. And then in 1998, He was asked to become the chief operating officer at Harris Entertainment, a casino company. In 2003, he became CEO of Harris, which then, after it merged with Caesars Palace, became known as Caesars. He stayed in that role until he became executive chairman. He then stepped out of um, Caesars and went to work for Aetna, where he ran about half of their business. And after Aetna was bought by CVS, he left Aetna and started his own health-related startup called Well. Gary is made the amazing transition from being a professor to actually doing something useful, like running a company. He is extraordinarily thoughtful on issues of power, influence, and coming in as an outsider and being exceptionally successful. He took Harris stock price from about 15 or 16 when he arrived to a leveraged buyout in 2007 of about $90 a share. So he has made both himself and other people a lot of money and is an extraordinarily effective executive. And so, Gary, welcome to the Pfeffer on Power podcast. Thank you for being here. Jeffrey, I'm delighted as always to be with you. So I want us to talk today about two or three things for which you are justifiably famous. First of all, when you came in the Caesars, Harris at the time, you of course came in from outside in an industry dominated by insiders and most of the people who are going to work with you and for you were not happy to see you there. And so one of the things that you were exceptionally astute and successful at doing is getting people to be on your side and to overcome that resistance. And part of that involves doing something which I think is kind of an unnatural act. Because when you come into an organization and the people are not happy to see you, your natural tendency is going to be to not like them, to push them away, and to avoid them. But as you, of course, have pointed out, critical relationships have to work. So could you describe what you did and how you made yourself able to deal with people who didn't want you to be there? So, Jeffrey, let me say at the outset that although my circumstances were somewhat extraordinary, what I'm about to say, I think, applies to the vast majority of people who either enter an organization for the first time or are elevated within their organization. In my case, I had been on the faculty at the Harvard Business School. I had never worked in a managerial or executive position in my entire life. And all of a sudden, I was introduced as the chief operating officer overseeing essentially all of Harris businesses with the exception of a few staff functions. And when I had the discussion with the gentleman who hired me, my predecessor and CEO, Phil Satry, it was clear to me that the people who had been contending for this job that I had been offered at the top of the list were not going to be very enthusiastic about the fact that, first, that they didn't get it, and second, that it went to somebody whose qualifications they would consider to be completely inadequate for the job. So I began thinking, before I had spoken to any of them, how am I going to turn this very poor initial set of circumstances into something that can be successful. And I took that on one person at a time and tried to think about how can I make this unwanted news, this truly unwelcome news, be at least tolerable for each person. And I would suggest if you're a graduate of a business school or if you've come off a successful position in your career and you're now being elevated to something new, the circumstances are not so extreme, but you're in a comparable situation where people although they're maybe entirely good-hearted, they're hoping to get that job themselves or they're expecting someone whose credentials meet a certain description that may not be the same as your own. So I took it on literally as an agenda item of mine to make every one of those relationships among the people in my orbit 
successful. And that included not only my new direct reports, who were all the operating executives, the chief information officer, the chief marketing officer, and the like, but also my peer, the chief financial officer, whose attitude, behavior, and receptivity was critical to my success, as well, of course, as my boss, the chief executive officer. And back in the days when we carried around yellow pads with writing on them, I wrote down each day, what am I going to do to make each of these relationships successful? And this involved humility, being clear about what I knew and what I didn't know, and the latter being quite considerable, of course, being transparent about what I was doing and why I was doing it, welcoming their feedback on it, being the first to report anything that wasn't going well so that no one felt as if I was obfuscating or keeping them from the truth, and trying to suggest to them that our collective success was in their interest, that while I had not been an executive in the past, I had been successful at my profession, and that I felt confident that together we would be successful at what we were trying to do. And I needed their help to do it. I would rely on them in many, many ways, and that collectively we would make progress. Now, to the latter part of your question, in most human interaction, we have the luxury of having relationships that we're not interested in and we don't want to invest in and we may not find appealing at all. And that is the grist of everyday life. It's the what we see on movies and television shows all the time, relationships that are off-putting to us and we walk away from them or we're cynical about them. But in executive life, these relationships have to work. You have a duty to your constituents, your shareholders, your colleagues, the employees, your customers – to have those relationships work, even if you find the individual unappealing or tedious or trying, you just don't have the luxury of writing that off and minimizing it in some way. You have to make it work. The only remedy is if you replace the individual, if you've come to the view that that's the right choice. But in the absence of that, you have to make that relationship work. And that involves, I think, a, a great degree of flexibility in terms of looking and seeking a path that will allow this relationship to prosper, even if it seems like under most circumstances it wouldn't. That's a little dehumanizing in many respects, because that's not the way any of us are prone to behave on our own. But it is one of the sacrifices you make when you ascend to one of these positions where these relationships, each one of them is so important. And how are you able to discipline yourself? I mean, because normally, of course, we operate under the norm of reciprocity. So if you like me, I like you. But in this situation, you come in and people may resent you for being there. This is not unusual because many people believe that they deserve the job that others have gotten more than they do. And they resent you and whatever. And so it is really it really requires an enormous amount of discipline and self-control to manage yourself in those situations. How did you build that? Or how would you suggest other people build and develop that? Is there some mental discipline that you engaged in or some way of thinking about it that, that made you successful at this? Well, I think you, your question anticipates the answer, really. It, it does require a level of discipline. Normally, we engage with a person we meet and we continue in so far as we find it appealing and successful. But in these cases, that can't be the decision rule that guides you. You have to come into it with the view that making the relationship successful is the objective. That is what you have to do to be successful here. It's not that you win over the person's affection or that they necessarily respect you or that they'd like to have you around a holiday dinner table, <laughs> but rather that you can make that relationship work and you can find a rhythm and a series of common interests, complementarity between your skills and theirs that at least gives them the view that they can succeed with you. And it does require a lot of discipline, a lot of self-censure to make that work. As you know, Jeffrey, I had a number of relationships in the industry that were somewhat similar. I had competitors who were very difficult people, and the interactions with them were not very appealing and required the same approach, that I knew that my company needed me to make that relationship work. This included politicians, very senior American politicians or state-level politicians, competitors, and boy, I'd love to walk in and come into contact with these folks and tell them what I thought, but you just, <laughs> that would have been an irresponsible action that in that setting, I really didn't feel like I could do. 
Yeah. And so what you're really talking about is being strategic and thoughtful as you interact with other people. And that I think is, uh, that's an amazing quality and it made you, I think, uh, quite successful. The other quality that I think made you very successful at Harrah's and then Caesar's, as it changed its name, was your ability to relate to people throughout the organization and to show up with energy, even if you didn't necessarily feel energetic at the time. There's a lot of talk these days about, in quotes, authenticity. And I don't want to say that you're inauthentic, but I do remember you saying that when you would show up sometimes at a casino, you would be tired and people needed your energy and you had to put on, if you will, a show. That you had to sometimes show up and act with energy that you didn't feel and to put out of your head issues that it might be going on in your personal life or in other aspects of your life. How were you able to do that? Well, I think you've hit upon a contrast of two notions that really requires a lot of thought on each of our part. One is authenticity, and the other is what's required to be an effective leader of people who have relatively limited access to you. So let's touch on each of those. So for example, if someone were to ask me a question in public, did I believe that my job caused sacrifice among members of my family? The only authentic answer to that has to be yes. Clearly, my absence, my distraction, my fatigue, all these things were a burden that my family members had to bear. And if you want to suggest that you can do it without that, I think you're being inauthentic. You're just obfuscating the the obvious truth of it. On the other hand, if you're going into a facility, in my case, these were casino, hotel, restaurant operations, and you're going to see staff in a location maybe once a year or perhaps twice a year. And from that limited exposure, the people who work there are going to draw a conclusion about whether the CEO of the company is interested in them, cares about their view of their circumstances, which are generally very limited to the area where they work and not what's going on across the world necessarily. And is this person well-suited to the job? And if you come in and you're fatigued and you're ornery and disinterested, then of course they have every reason to walk away disaffected and think that the company is in in capable hands. And so again, much like the conversation about the need for relationships to work, I think you have a duty to them and to the other members of your team that you give those folks your best self. Now you may then walk away and go up to your room and collapse And that certainly happened uh, when the adrenaline went down more than once. But I think that's what people deserve. And it has a tremendous effect that people feel valued in that in that moment. Yeah. And of course, requires enormous energy. One of the things that I think also was outstanding about your time as running this organization was your determination to tell the truth under all circumstances. And I recall when you came in about 2009 after the 2008 financial crisis to my class, you talked about how CEOs oftentimes did not tell the truth. People, of course, uh, said that Bear Stearns' financial statements were in great shape just before it collapsed, and Lehman Brothers, the same thing. And you had really determined that you were gonna be as honest as you could possibly be with people, even if the news wasn't good. So I had spent a lot of time in my training and as an academic thinking about this idea of reputation and how you sustain credibility. And I was convinced, this was an abstract notion at the time, that if you consistently said things that were later proven to be untrue, it was unlikely people would pay much attention to you in the future. And this was a asset you really couldn't afford to squander. And this had to do with telling people the truth about individuals or circumstances in the company, the future of the company's potential to earn money, projects that you were going to do or not do, reasons why you made certain decisions that might be unclear to people. And I just dug in at the outset and said, I'm, I may not comment on a topic if for some reason I can't, but if I comment on it, I'm never going to purposefully say something that is demonstrably untrue. Now, that was a carefully worded statement in, in a minute, but mm. I was not going to say the future looks great when I know it doesn't, or I'm not going to say the company's going to have better results next quarter when I knew it wouldn't, or that we're going to fix up this part of the hotel when I knew we had no capital to fix it up, or whatever the example may be. And I, I am concerned that even the casual listener to 
media today, something like CNBC, for example, if you listen to CEOs, you will very rarely ever find them say something that they haven't been positioned or trained to say by someone who manages their message. And I think that does great damage and it, it doesn't serve them well in the long term. Yeah. And your example was, I think, the very vivid example of this was the story about an employee who, who had uh, committed suicide. We had a tragically a situation where a fellow who worked for us in Nevada was relieved of his job and committed suicide just a couple of days thereafter. And the local management team was suggested that we issue an email to all of our employees indicating that this gentleman had died of natural causes. And of course, that was comforting to the family and it was comforting to his friends in the local operation, but it was also demonstrably untrue. We knew that he had not died of natural causes. So I stopped that email and I said to them, you cannot comment on the cause of death, which you've undoubtedly seen now in many instances with celebrities, for example, that when there's a suicide involved, you'll see no cause of death is given and the press comments on that and they leave it at that. They were welcome to handle it in those terms, uh, but they simply couldn't say something that was demonstrably untrue. And that, uh, when I held to that position, people were very unhappy with me about it. But it was an example of trying to stick to this view that I hoped would define a bit of the way I wanted us to, to operate. And the other statement that you're quite famous for, and I want you to expand a little bit on this, though you've already kind of alluded to it, is the idea that if you want to be liked, get a dog. That one of the things that you had to do in a senior leadership position is take tough decisions that some people would not like, including laying people off when the finances went south after the 2008 financial crisis, et cetera. Can you speak to this issue of seeking to be liked even in a senior executive role? I think we all want to be liked. I like to do things that you react favorably to, Jeffrey. We're friends and I want to do things that are good for you. We all want to be liked. The problem is that in executive roles, as much as we may wish to do that, we can't. And this comes up in so many instances. I'll give a couple of examples. Oftentimes, it's important to limit an executive scope of duty for a period of time to get more focused execution on a smaller agenda. So you have to go to a accomplished person and say, you've been doing items one through four. Now I'd like to take three and four and assign them to Mr. Pfeffer. I want you to focus on one and two. No one ever takes that well. <laughs> it's never a message where someone says, oh boy, what a relief. I only have to worry about one and two. That's fantastic. And if you think the person is going to be fond of you as a result of that conversation, you're deluding yourself. They don't like it. If you take away resources from something someone is interested in, if you have to eliminate positions and downsize a workforce somewhere, if you have to sell an asset that you've really cared about. I had an instance early on where we had a casino in Louisiana, and I absolutely adored the people there, and they were terrific. They did a great job and were loyal to our customers. We ended up, for various reasons, having to sell it, and I went down there and stood in front of them and told them, why it was we were doing this and how much I regretted it. And I didn't think for a minute that anybody there was going to be very happy with me about it. But that was the message that needed to be delivered. And it was the straight story about how we had come to that decision. You know, ironically, Jeffrey, from your introduction, the place I learned this first was in the forced curve grading distribution at Harvard Business School, where you're obliged to assign a failing grade to the bottom 10% of the students. And a student would come in to see me halfway through the semester and say, uh, hey, professor, how am I doing? Now, the natural answer to that, just like someone says, how are you today? Your natural answer is that you're doing fine. But I discovered that that person who was doing poorly was going to likely be in the 10%, and that could disrupt their ability to earn their degree and cause great hardship to them. So I learned in my first year that if they were at risk, you needed to look them in the face and say, you're not doing well at all. And if things continue, you're going to wind up in this bottom bucket, and that's going to be a real hardship for you. The process began to train me. When I told people that they were at risk of being in the bottom 10%, not once did they ever see it the same way. Not <laughs> once. So that's the, where this expression comes from. If you want a creature that's going to love you every day, and every time that you see him, you better get a dog, because the people you're working with are never going to meet that standard. 
Thank you for that answer. And thank you for being so candid. And thank you for being with us uh, today. This has been the Pfeffer on Power podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. For further information, you can go to my personal website, jeffreypfeffer.com. The last name is spelled P-F-E-F-F-E-R.com. We've had the privilege today of listening to Gary Loveman, the former CEO of Caesars, the large casino company, a former senior executive at Aetna, and now running well, a health-related startup. Every other week, we come on and have a discussion with somebody to talk about power and influence. And today's discussion with Gary, I think, has illustrated some very important points. Thank you for spending the time. My pleasure, Jeff. Join us in a couple of weeks for another wonderful guest.